Hey there, folks. Big T back with another one. And I really wanted this one to be my Wii vs. GameCube video that's kind of been in the works for a long, long time. Uh, basically since before, a few months before the Switch launched. Um, but, you know, with these types of videos uh, are harder for me to do um, because they take a lot of time. And I've been really busy. Uh, my business has been uh, doing pretty well. And uh, it's you know it's just been hard to do these types of videos that are uh, really involved and whatnot instead of just doing the commentary stuff. So retro death, I'm coming for you. <laughs> just wait a little bit longer. But actually, this video is kind of a preemptive strike or a uh, sister video to that video anyway. And it's called Nintendo Never Understood GameCube. And you're like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> well, um, this will actually tie into the Wii U and what happened with the Wii U. But uh, I'm basically saying that Nintendo never really understood what they wanted to do with the GameCube. They were kind of all over the place in their messaging as well as uh, the marketing. Um, and I want to start talk first talking about... The Nintendo 64, um, a lot of you guys may not remember, but the first things I was hearing about the 64 was about how powerful it was. Oh, it's going to be a very powerful uh, console. It's you know, silicon graphics and the, all these partnerships. Uh, it was very focused on the tech. And um, obviously, um, this, the Nintendo 64 got pushed back from 95. It was supposed to come out. Uh, in the 95 got pushed back to 96 and a lot of that likely had to do with the fact that uh everything they wanted to do with the n64 was going to be way too expensive to put in a box um and they had to scale back so a lot of the the chipset stuff they were doing they uh, actually put in like rares um uh, arcade cabinet for uh for killer instinct back then and they were saying that this is how you know, this is the stuff that's going to power the N64. And obviously that didn't come to fruition. And uh, uh, once uh, they decided to go with cartridges, uh, they lost a lot of the third party support they were um, expecting to have. And they kind of had to change courses on the N64. Um, it went from, you know, oh, all the powerful talk to, uh, you know, quality over quantity <laughs> and uh, things like that and um, they actually salvaged the N64 because it was pretty bleak there in the beginning of the N64's lifespan outside of Mario 64 obviously um, people didn't know what to make of it it sold pretty well based on the fact that you know Nintendo was coming off uh, the very popular Super Nintendo um, people just, you know, expected more of the same. So it sold pretty well in the beginning, but the game stopped. There was a huge drought on the N64, like I said, because, you know, uh, people, they, uh, developers that Nintendo was expecting to be there weren't there, understandably, because not only were the cartridges expensive, but Nintendo was asking for absorbent, hope that's a word, I think that's a word, <laughs> exorbitant um, uh, licensing fees, like, all, it was like already expensive enough to make games for the N64 uh, because of the cartridges, but Nintendo also was charging really high licensing fees. They should have cut back, and uh, maybe Square would have been around, you know, or maybe not. Maybe that wouldn't change. But yeah, so they realized that they couldn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, all about how powerful it was and the graphics and all that stuff. That stuff you could still see. It still mattered, obviously, but Nintendo changed course and they started. They made the N64 the fun machine, and you could see the marketing change, and uh, they figured out what the N64 was. It, it got its, you know, got its legs, and obviously the N64 uh, was a very innovative console, so that helped. You know, the Rumble Pack and the uh, the uh, Transfer Pack, and you know all that stuff, and the ex you know expansion pack that went into the console itself. And, the, you know, the four, I think the biggest thing was probably the four controller ports. That was the biggest thing that helped Nintendo transition into the fun machine aspect. And they did all the different colors. 
and they got it together. And while it wasn't uh, successful as far as uh, uh, as far as uh, install base uh, as the Super Nintendo, N64 was a very successful console. They uh, made a nice amount of money off of that thing, and it sold uh, what 33 million units, um, which is probably better than it should have done with the circumstances. And uh, you know, the salvage obviously they had world class uh, developing going on. Uh, they tried to create this dream team, they lost some people in that, but uh, there were some great games on the N64 you couldn't get anywhere else. Um, on consoles, there was no better place to play a first person shooter uh, than the N64, um, and uh, that was the place for you know that first person shooters, obviously. Party games, Mario Kart, uh, four player, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Mario Party, Super Smash Brothers, uh, the the first one. Like so, it just came out of nowhere. It was a big hit. So they were able to salvage um, the N64, and they s- kind of went into the GameCube with that mentality of power again, to some extent. Um, and it was, this is going to be a core console, you know, we're going to get the third parties that we lost on N64 back and they kind of, they kind of let the third parties do their thing, uh, early on with the N64. Um, you know, Rogue Squadron, uh, wasn't a third party, it was a second party game. Nintendo funded it, I believe with LucasArts and Factor 5 developing and, uh, uh, you know, that was you know, a, a partnership that came from the N64's Rogue Squadron, the first one. Um, and if you look at Nintendo's first party efforts, um, and this one's for you, Retro Death, uh, Mario, you know, putting out no Mario game for the first time in Nintendo's history was very strange. And Luigi Mansion was a, you know, it was a cool distraction. It was an okay game. Um, but there wasn't a lot to it. I think you could beat it in probably what five or six hours, seven hours maybe. Um, and you know, it was the the gameplay was kind of repetitive. I mean, it was definitely a gorgeous game. Um, but you know, you were sucking ghosts. It was no, there wasn't there wasn't a lot to it. It wasn't the Mario game for the GameCube and uh, Nintendo. The GameCube didn't have an identity. Uh, to some degree, didn't have that Nintendo identity. Um, there were some really good third parties on there. Um, EA was actually there in the beginning with Madden, and uh, um, I think NBA Live was there. I'm not sure. I can't remember, but I, I did pick up Madden. That was one of the first games I got on my uh, GameCube. Was Madden? I got um, uh, Luigi's Mansion, Madden, uh, Super Monkey Ball, and uh, Rogue Squadron. Those are the games I bought. I worked at, uh, I was working at Walmart at the time. I was working there for like four months. And uh, if you know, if you know Walmart, the policy is 90 days and then you get that 10% discount. And so I had just got my 10% discount and I uh, bought my GameCube November 2001 and uh, quit because <laughs> uh, Walmart sucks. People talk about GameStop sucking. Walmart is just as bad, if not worse. Um, I think it's worse because it's, you know, a lot of it's manual labor and whatever. But um, the GameCube had like strange commercials and Nintendo seemed to want, like I said, wanted to go for the core kind of appeal, bring back those third parties, you know, and uh, but you wanted to do that with the purple lunchbox, (laughs) you know, like. It wanted to appeal to a group of people that were n- it would never appeal to because of basically how it looked. Um, it had that strange handle on the back, uh, so you can carry it around the house easily, like a five-year-old. <laughs> like it just it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And obviously, going with the purple color, I think last minute they probably decided let's do black as well. I think black was the other color. That one was the harder one to find. Uh, they didn't manufacture that many. And so the purple one was, you know, the one everybody got. But it was just, you know, the console itself was bland. It was pretty bland looking. Um, some of this stuff I'm going to go over in my Wii versus GameCube video. Uh, but I just wanted to do this because I know it would be more in-depth with that stuff. Um, 
like I said, like the first party representation wasn't there. You had a new IP in Pikmin, but it was, you know, Pikmin. I love Pikmin games, but they are um, uh, pretty niche when it comes to Nintendo IP. Uh, they don't sell, you know, millions of copies. They sell a million, a little bit over. Um, and they're really good games. I think Pikmin 3 is the best as far as I'm concerned. But, um, but you know, you start off no Mario game. Uh, Luigi's Mansion, which is kind of strange, and you know, Rogue Squadron was great. Um, great Star Wars game, obviously, uh, beautiful game uh, to this day. Um, but there was no like Nintendo identity, and obviously, you got Smash in December, I believe it came out December of 2001. But again, Smash is a, it's a fighting game. It's not um, a mass appeal game. You either like Smash or you don't, and uh, you know, uh, you know, today it might sell consoles, but I don't really think it sold consoles in that day. Um, it was still a pretty new IP at the time. So, it was, you know, it's just like, and that continued with uh, throughout the GameCube's life, where the the first party stuff, you know, obviously Metroid Prime series was great, but. You know, nothing was like really strong as far as the first party games on the GameCube. Uh, Zelda was uh, Wind Waker, but when you see the thing about Wind Waker is beloved now. But when Wind Waker first came out, people were really upset about the art style and it was uh, it was divisive. And so, well, we think of it as a great game now and it, w it was a great game now it was a great game. Then it was a very divisive game. And so when people saw that, they were upset. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, I remember reading the message boards and uh, people were not happy to see Link look like a little 10 year old kid. <laughs> you know, like they were expecting uh, that Space World demo, you know, that we got in 2000, where it showed Link facing off against Ganon. Um, and it looked great, you know, look, you know, quote unquote, more realistic. And uh, so where a game like that could have made a splash, it didn't, you know, initially because of the divisive uh, you know, fan base, the fan base being uh, divided on the art style. So there was just things like that. And then when you finally got Mario, oh, my gosh, like I'm a huge Mario fan. Mario is probably my favorite franchise of all time. Um, but I I like Sunshine. But to me, it did. It wasn't up to par with. Uh, Mario 64 or what you would expect from Nintendo first party like Mario was kind of slippery his controls the camera was whoa that camera like um, people made fun of my gameplay when I put up a Mario Sunshine gameplay a few months back and oh man you're not really good at this game uh, I I was and I am but the thing is going back to that camera was like jarring like it was uh, I implore you to do that. I implore you to go, especially after playing some as buttery smooth as the Galaxy camera. Uh, going back to Sunshine was like whoa, and like I said, uh, Mario is slippery. He did, he's not as the tight. The controls is not as tight as even the N64. And so did again, like everything, nothing really hit, hit, hit. Uh, outside of maybe Mario Kart Double Dash, which was a great game, it was definitely a great party game. I played so many hours with friends in that game. Um, I love Mario Kart, um, but the games just didn't hit home. Wave Race was, you know, not what um, we were expecting after the N64 one. It was just something was just off about that game, and you know, you know, uh, F Zero. Nintendo didn't even do F Zero, and that game came out really late. In the GameCube's life cycle, it came out in 2005. Um, same goes for uh, uh, same goes for um, a Star Fox Assault. That was a late game. I think it was 2005 also. And the Star Fox game we got was not a Star Fox game. It was Dinosaur Planet meets Star Fox because you know Rare made Dinosaur Planet and Miyamoto talked them into uh, putting Star Fox characters into it. So. It wasn't a bad game, but uh, it, it it just it was kind of a, a weak attempt at Zelda, you know, with Star Fox characters. It, it, it wasn't the, the puzzles weren't as good. And it, it, 
felt somewhat shallow here and there, especially with the flying stuff was definitely tacked on. And I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not upset that it was a, the game that it was, that it wasn't a traditional Star Fox game. I just don't think the game uh, overall was great. Like it, like we felt it should have been for a Star Fox game. Um, and it was just, it was again, disjointed. And you finally got Star Fox Assault, but again, that wasn't even made by Nintendo. That was made by Namco, I think, made Star Fox Assault. And people hated the on-foot missions. Like, it was so much stuff like that for the GameCube. It was just so much disjointedness. And uh, that reflected itself in the marketing. The marketing for GameCube was weak. And uh, I'm going to save <laughs> uh, some of the stuff, uh, the marketing, uh, for my GameCube, my Wii versus GameCube video. But it was just like, stuff like that was just off. The GameCube was just off. And Nintendo was pretty much off. Like, I remember an E3 when Nintendo came... Uh, and they showcased for most of the E3 Pac-Man versus <laughs> like Miyamoto it was this big thing with Pac-Man and Miyamoto helped develop a, pa a new Pac-Man game where um, it was very much uh, the beginning ideas of for the Wii U where one guy uh, played uh, or uh, one guy was Pac-Man. They went around the map and they, uh, you know, did what Pac-Man does, eat pellets and all that stuff. And you had four players as the ghosts. But the problem is you needed four damn GameCube, or not GameCube, you needed four Game Boy Advances to, you know, kind of have your own screen and play as the ghosts. And it was just like, again, Nintendo did not know what they were doing with the GameCube for the most part. It was like they wanted to be a core system, but they told Rockstar we don't, um, if I, I'm pretty sure I got this right. Um, they didn't allow Grand Theft Auto on the GameCube. That was going to be a thing. And uh, they said no to it, you know, because they wanted to have this, at the at that time, they wanted to have this family-friendly fr image, but yet they had, they were trying to uh, court core gamers. It was just, again, Nintendo did not know <laughs> what they were doing with the GameCube. Um, and that kind of uh, whispers, if you will, to the Wii U, where it was like, they they let the third parties go first. They didn't have anything big first party wise uh, at launch, and they was like, "Oh, we're gonna go to the core." And those games didn't sell. They were bad ports, and then some of them, you know, some of them were bad ports. Some, of them, you know, a couple of them were good. Uh, the Tekken was good, um, but uh, they didn't sell well. And then the third parties basically dipped out, and Nintendo was left holding, you know their pants with no belt and they had to scramble and figure out what they were going to do with the Wii U. So it had a weird identity. It's like it wanted to be this core system, but then it had all these kind of party light games you know, really light arcadey style games. And you can't do both. Uh, you can't focus on both at the same time. And, you know, eventually uh, at least the Nintendo games on the Wii U were really good. You know the first party games and um but obviously it didn't sell well at the end of the day and it has the same weaknesses as the gamecube had where it was um but it didn't have the third party <laughs> you know so that's why it ended up selling uh less than the gamecube even so you know th these are the reasons why uh for me gamecube is one of nintendo's weakest consoles um because it, there was not a lot of special there. You had the Metroid Prime series. You had Eternal Darkness. Um, I'll touch on that too. I don't want to really get into all the game stuff, but I just wanted to focus on uh, the weird marketing, uh, the weird strategies uh, that N Nintendo tried to employ with it, and they just never knew. You can tell when Nintendo feels comfortable with their console, and they just go all out. They go balls deep. <laughs> um, they knew what they were gonna do with the Wii. And the marketing was on point, and the peripherals, or peripherals and the games, it, it knew, that machine knew, um, Nintendo knew what that machine was about, and they exploited it. And the same with the Switch right now. Nintendo understands the Switch. They market it the right way, and they, you know, they know 
what it's about and and that that shows in the type of games that's coming for it and they you know they're comfortable and i feel like when they're not comfortable we get the gamecube and we get wii u when nintendo's not comfortable with their console and knowing exactly what they want to do with it i mean so yeah that's my video let me know what you guys think do you agree with this um this is something that popped in my head while i was coming you know working on that uh GameCube versus Wii video, and uh, that's coming very, very soon. I promise you, um, Retro Death, I'm coming for you. Um, it's gonna be hard to combat my video. Just letting you know. And uh, yeah, so let me know what you guys think about this one in the comments below. Do you agree? Do you think I'm right? I feel like when Nintendo is uncomfortable, uh, when they don't really know what their focus is, it shows, and it shows in marketing. You know, bad marketing. It shows in direction of the console and uh you know you might end up with a purple lunchbox with a handle <laughs> um, or you can get the cool you know sweetness that is the wii and the switch the cool uh innovative innovative um they know they they know what those consoles were about from day one they had it together from day one they know who they wanted to sell to and they did it as always, thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you fools next time. Peace out. Oh yeah, one more thing. Play Nintendo, fools. Dude.